Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Eureka podcast, the Eureka Group podcast. Uh, this is going to be our seventh weekly roundup. Uh, we got a lot to talk about, uh, so going right into our usual routine uh, and covering coronavirus uh, data, uh, we are about to surpass the 35 million mark for global cases, uh, and deaths uh, has recently surpassed 1 million with 1,032,000. Uh, however, we are uh, worldwide uh, managing to keep up um, between recovery and caseload with 25 million recovered. Uh, but if you look at uh, the daily new cases and the daily new deaths, uh, the, uh, the seven-day moving average is starting to increase. Uh, daily deaths moving downward, though, uh, which is consistent with the medical data. We know much more about the virus. We know how to Again, there's not an officially supported vaccine or treatment, but uh, generally speaking, the mortality rate is is decreasing. Uh, and uh, in the in the United States, uh, data is actually looking pretty well on the up and up. The uh, daily new cases was uh, originally around fifty fifty two thousand. Currently, it's at forty seven thousand uh, or forty eight thousand. And uh, new deaths, while it was normally at around 1,000 or 1,100, it is currently at around uh, 790, 800. Uh, India, its cases are continuing to climb. It's already uh, on par with the United States, uh, uh, well on its way to surpassing it. Uh, its daily new cases are quickly becoming uh, nearly twice ours. Uh, and its deaths are looking similar to what the United States numbers were a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and then uh, Brazil and Russia uh, following more or less closely behind, but uh, their numbers, particularly Russia's, are uh, far, far more favorable than than ours, especially when you consider that uh, we are, by about a million cases, still the number one country uh, most affected by the coronavirus at 7.5 million cases, about 5 million recovered, 4.7 million to be to be precise, but uh, deaths are at uh, 200 and 213,000 now. Uh, we would normally get into uh, our individual takes uh, on the uh, on the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, uh, but uh, our spotlight here uh, that I'm, I'm kind of rushing through specifically because I want to get to it, I want to hear what everyone has to say, is President Trump and his wife Melania tested positive for COVID-19, which he tweeted Friday night. Uh, the virus was transmitted to him from advisor Hope Hicks, uh, but his opponents, Joe Biden, Kamala Harris, their respective spouses, Jill and Doug, uh, they all tested negative. Uh, and in fact, they all expressed sympathy for the president uh, and uh, wished him a speedy recovery. Ironically, he tested positive for the coronavirus on China's national anniversary. This can change his poll numbers in a huge way, most likely downward, possibly up slightly due to sympathy uh, in the event that he's cured by the the vaccine that he's been accelerating. Supposedly, it's mere weeks away if you take his quote from the debate. That could, if that happens, that could close the, the, the gap between himself and Biden. Uh, but it doesn't just mean a lot for the presidential election. It means a lot for Congress, too. Uh, one of the GOP senators from North Carolina tested positive recently. This has ramifications for the future debates, for the Supreme Court confirmations, everything else. So I'm gonna I'm gonna kick it off immediately and hand it off to Andy. Andy, what's your take on all of this? So I think the fact that the President of the United States has now become, I believe, the third major foreign leader test positive for COVID-19 is devastating news for America's image abroad. I believe the only two other countries uh, are the UK and Brazil. So we're talking about Prime Minister Boris Johnson and Brazilian Prime Minister or President uh, Jair Bolsonaro, both of whom are also very right-wing populist leaders, kind of in the mold of, of Donald Trump. Uh, we know that during the campaign, President Trump has repeatedly said that he does not believe wearing a mask is necessary. You know, he's still continued to hold these massive rallies with thousands of people in attendance. And that's actually likely how Hope Hicks was able to get infected, is that she was apparently in very close proximity to certain uh, members of the camp, other, uh, whether it was supporters or military members in Minnesota. So this happened very recently. Um, and, you know, I wish the president well. I obviously wish his wife the best as well. Uh, but I do find it extremely ironic that, uh, you know, the president spent so much time during the last six months basically refusing to take the virus seriously, and now he is personally suffering from it. 
uh, with over 200,000 Americans dead. Now the president of the United States also suffering from this virus. I just find it extremely ironic. Again, I wish him a speedy recovery because our country still needs continuity of leadership. And I think the, uh, the alternative to having a president who is recovering is a president who is extremely sick and, and that would be devastating politically. I think it would just cause a lot more division for our country. So hopefully the president has finally learned his lesson. Masks are important. Don't hold those outdoor rallies. And we're less than a month away from the election. So we'll see what happens. Yeah, I also see the irony in President Trump getting the coronavirus, especially the day after he was at the debate with Joe Biden and he was making fun of Joe Biden for wearing his mask too much. And uh, and then we have President Trump himself getting the coronavirus. Maybe he should have worn his mask a little bit more. But this does have a very serious implication on how fragile and weak, almost pathetic, the United States has become when it comes to dealing with these kinds of issues that we shouldn't be having problems dealing with. I remember when I was very young and China in the early 2000s was dealing with a lot of pandemics themselves, a lot of diseases, and we were kind of making fun of them because their government couldn't handle quarantining or treating any of their citizens who were getting sick and hundreds of thousands of Chinese citizens died. And now we have the reversal where China has been very effective at dealing with the coronavirus, and we have not, even though we like to think ourselves as being better than China. It turns out in this situation, China has beaten us, and they're starting to beat us in a lot more uh, different areas of not just economics or social issues, but also global issues and the military and whatnot. So this is just another example of how the United States is dwaning in our power and our efficiency and our drive to be a shining city on the hill. We're more like looking like a dirty trailer park now compared to other countries. And it's mostly because of nepotism and this core... Uh, court culture that we've developed in our capital where they only care about what people perceive our congressmen and leaders as instead of what they actually are. I wish the president and the first lady a speedy recovery uh, during these tough times. Look, the president's strongman identity is under attack by the invisible enemy, COVID-19. And um, this is a president who prides himself on being stronger than anything and unstoppable force. Well, he, the president is confronting a dark reality, which is even those of us in, our, in this society that believe we're stronger than this virus, the reality is, uh, when individuals get infected with it, they face a lot of pain. And um, so far, we've heard of mild symptoms for the president. We don't know what's going to happen in the next few days. Um, we could run into a huge issue governance wise. You know, what is Mike Pence's role? Even though the president is sick, I've heard um, that the president will be working um, from the medical center that he is currently at um, but it's a huge issue for his campaign and um, we're really at a tough time in our country whether regardless of what you think about this president um, he has not performed well um, leading the country on the coronavirus and now it's come back to bite him We'll see what happens in the next few days, but we're in for a bumpy October, and the October surprise has definitely surprised all of us. Definitely a, a compelling analysis on, on all counts. Of course, we're going to be getting to the debate 
But first, let's uh, break down the actual uh, data uh, in the uh, presidential election polls. As you can see, while it's somewhat even, Trump definitely is uh, getting his foot in that door. A lot of blue dashes right here uh, in national polls. Uh, uh, Biden is up by uh, uh, 10 points in some places, uh, like uh, uh, New York, 61%. And in the places where Trump is leading, it's quite narrow. Like Texas, a Republican stronghold, 49% Trump, 47 Biden. Uh, you some would uh, would purport this to the uh, exoduses from a lot of historically liberal states like California. Uh, large businesses, a lot of them uh, moving their main warehouses and properties to Texas. Uh, places like like Alaska, a, a one point lead, 47 Trump, 46 Biden, uh, and you can uh, see this uh, reflected in our on our down ballot polls. Democrats leading Michigan, Arizona, Georgia, uh, North Carolina, New Hampshire, Maine, Massachusetts. Uh, Republicans leading uh, South Carolina, Kansas, Texas, Alaska. Uh, these are really some of the only places they have left. Tied in Iowa, in House generic, Democrats leading by eight points. Uh, Democrats leading in North Carolina, Republicans uh, still, you know, leading in New Hampshire, New Hampshire, North Dakota. So uh, you know, let's be clear: Republicans are not out of this race by by any means, uh, but uh, they have been treading water for a, for a very long time. A general consensus that uh, it, it might be only so long before they uh, start to drown, uh, but we'll we'll see. You know, no, November, believe it or not, is still a ways away, but. Of course, the highlight that we were expecting to talk about uh, in this episode in, in national news was the presidential debate, uh, the first one. Uh, and it was overwhelmingly met with disappointment and cynicism. Uh, I watched the debates live on C-SPAN uh, with some of my colleagues, uh, mostly in, in media and political science. We had an immediate post-debate analysis over who lost. And uh, most of us agreed that the real loser in all of this was Chris Wallace. Man's going to need need therapy after this. Uh, uh, minutes upon minutes of both candidates speaking unintelligibly over one another, constant interruptions. Um, pro-life, pro-choice policy was completely ne neglected. Not a single question from Chris involved those agendas, apart from passing remarks on Roe v. Wade. Uh, very little co uh, concrete discussion on economic policies. There, there was obviously that was an agenda in the segments, but very little of it could you actually hear. But some intelligible highlights uh, was Biden's surprising amount of composure. Republicans were really pushing this idea that he was going to perform terribly in the debates. I thought that he would perform terribly in the debates, but very few gaffes, clear speech, very little stammering. He he did forget the name of his own college. <laughs> Um, he also claimed Antifa is uh, an, quote an idea, not an organization, which is which is false. Antifa is very much an organized group with concrete ideas. Um, he had to be pressured to even say the words "law and order," uh, and avoided the question when Trump pressured him to name a single uh, organization uh, on the part of law enforcement to support him. Uh, but of course, Trump was not exempt from his own errors. Journalists criticized what many would consider completely unhinged aggression. He alluded to disregarding the election's results if he lost. Uh, of course, the elephant in the room, he was quoted telling the Proud Boys, an alt-right organization, to stand down, stand by, unquote. Technically, Trump has disavowed white supremacists several times, particularly after he was endorsed by David Duke. Uh, but he's really struggling to disassociate with them, especially after his good people on both sides comment uh, after the confrontation in Charleston. Uh, now. Uh, obviously, I, I, all of us have uh, have a lot to say on this issue, so I'm just going to turn it over to everyone else. What do you What do you guys think? How do, How does this affect the election? So I think that the debates were absolutely an American disgrace. Um, I don't think there was really much of a winner uh, because you know it's definitely true. I think objectively that Biden performed much better than Trump. However, he wasn't really able to get his points across because the president kept on interrupting him nonstop. Um, and so I think a lot of voters probably walked out of this thing thinking, even if I don't like Trump, what does Biden actually stand for? What does he actually believe in? And Biden didn't really get a chance to talk about his agenda. For the president, it was mostly about, you know, no more coronavirus lockdowns. I'm supported by law and order. 
and really hammering the far left. I noticed one of his strategies during the debate was to force Biden to basically condemn the more progressive wing of the Democrat Party. So Biden had to come out and say, I'm not for single payer health care. I'm not for the Green New Deal. You know, I won the primary. Bernie lost. Um, and, and Trump's strategy was really to use the sort of far left socialist straw man that actually failed because he would have much rather had run against Warren or, or Sanders, but he got Biden. And I think that was the reason why he absolutely had a total meltdown during the debate was because it was basically impossible for him to project Biden as this far left candidate, because objectively speaking, he isn't. In fact, I'd argue that Biden's probably more conservative than Hillary. He's definitely more conservative than Obama for, for a fact. And so um, he's running against a moderate. He's running against a cent centrist. And so his message really should have been about his accomplishments, not attacking Biden endlessly and throwing in conspiracy theories about Ukraine and Russia and whatnot, uh, which was also really unprofessional. The, the personal attacks on Biden's son, I didn't see Biden engage in such ridiculous behavior on his part, although he did call the president a clown and he also called him, quote unquote, the worst president in American history. Um, but overall, I think, you know, President Trump had one clear goal, which was to narrow the race after the debate. And the only way he could have done that was if he had won it decisively. And he did not win the debate. He lost the debate. And not only did he lose the debate, he also came off as really unprofessional by viciously going after not just Biden, but also arguing with Chris Wallace, which I think was also just really unprofessional because you know, when we say this in athletics and you, you never yell at the referee, you never get into a fight with the referee. And if you do that, it's poor sportsmanship. So when the president decided to do that, he sounded really whiny. He sounded like a child throwing a tantrum. And I don't think it helped him with any swing voters at all. Yeah, I completely agree with that assessment. Uh, I do think that since he was diagnosed with coronavirus the next day, he probably already had coronavirus during the debate and maybe the virus was affecting his brain maybe he had a headache or a, a slight fever that was making him anxious or more aggressive i don't know but he's always been aggressive especially when it comes to debates if you look at 2016 so that's probably his genuine behavior which is even worse than if he was being affected by something like the coronavirus but yeah i, I totally agree that this entire debate was probably the last chance Donald Trump had at trying to secure the election and he completely flopped. It was, you know, what I say with the Republican National Convention, it was unhinged cringe. And I'll continue saying that because it's true and it will be reflected in how voters vote in the polls in less than five weeks. And I really don't see Trump coming back from this debate, even if he does well in the next debate, if we even have a next debate. Even if he does well in those things, I don't see the poll numbers going up for him because a lot of people are already voting right now. There's a huge turnout for early voting. And again, for the comments that he has made regarding the elections, I think that's encouraging more people to vote as early as possible so they don't wait to the last second and then maybe have their vote uncounted or, or discarded at the last second or something like that. So everything that he's doing is kind of just shooting himself in the foot multiple times. So I, I really don't see the president coming back from this completely agree with all of you uh the the president and it, that debate was a race to the bottom unfortunately it's the reality of the united states right now and what the political climate is but the president outdid joe biden and being worse than him i i think uh, the president's you know made for tv persona didn't look as great this time he's someone who relies on bold sound bites to stand out but he looked a, he looked really insecure i thought you know 
out of all of the debate performances President Trump has had as a politician, uh, what we saw um, in the first general election presidential debate in 2020, that was the worst. Um, he did not look like the kind of debater uh, like he was in the 2016 Republican primaries. If you notice towards the end of the 2016 Republican primary debates, he started to talk about policy, he started to talk about you know, economic issues that resonated with people, but he completely dropped the ball, had no plan uh, on the coronavirus uh, at all. Um, and, and what concerned me the most about President Trump was the last 10 minutes when he basically said that um, he will not fully accept the election results if he loses. Um, yes, he has hinted at that in the past in 2016, but I have never seen an elected president an elected president running for re-election say that openly on a debate stage. And that is an extremely concerning sign for any American. I truly believe that. All uh, incredibly interesting analyses. Uh, Andy, uh, just as an aside on, on your input, uh, while you're 100% correct. Trump did fail to to pin Biden as a as a far leftist. He did Biden Biden did more or less sell out to his more extreme left supporters. That might have been an acceptable loss for him because he he uh, won over Bernie um, by having moderates. Bernie scared a lot of moderates over his "let's have a revolution" kind of kind of rhetoric. Um, but uh, Biden, uh, early on in the debates, was on record saying, I'm the Democratic Party now. And I, and I can see so many people making uh, I am the Senate memes out of that with, uh, with Emperor Palpatine. And then, uh, and then for, uh, for you, Cameron, uh, I would say that yeah, you're, you're very correct. Trump, um, all of you were correct in saying that, that uh, Trump came across uh, as the uh, incumbent uh, being very unprofessional, especially uh, when he when he turned to Chris and said, "Well, I guess I'm debating you now." That very very unorthodox behavior. Um, but uh, I will say the the first say two three minutes of the debates were surprisingly civilized, um, and the the first question that was posed uh, was related to the Supreme Court. Uh, and if there's anything that's going to save Trump, then I would say it's it's confirming Justice Barrett. Um, as he said when he was posed with the question, uh, Barrett does have liberal endorsers, uh, and uh, especially for his existing voter base, to to get three pro-life justices on the Supreme Court, that is huge, uh, with, with uh, ramifications uh, possibly going uh, decades and decades into the future, decisions that could only be overturned in a future landmark case, which could be centuries for all we know. Definitely, uh, definitely a, a lot to consider, but uh, something, uh, Andrew, I know that you uh, uh, wanted to uh, discuss and, and bounce off of us uh, was this um, uh, in, in Congress, uh, a new stimulus bill has, uh, has been uh, roadblocked. Uh, Pelosi and the, and the GOP have just been continuing to butt heads uh, amidst the uh, extraordinary economic burden of the coronavirus. So if you could just brief us on that. Right. So there's been some interesting news in the, uh, in, in the Senate, in the House, we've had negotiations for a second stimulus check. If you guys remember, the first stimulus check happened, I think it was April or May. So it's already been half a year. And that was, I believe it was something like $1,200 for each family, a uh, family of four. So the stimulus check, the first stimulus check was able to make some progress in stemming the tide of the economic fallout of COVID-19. However, it's been half a year and there hasn't been a second stimulus check, which almost all economists agree is absolutely necessary to save our economy because we're currently in a very bad place economically speaking. This is a recession that is worse than 2008 and is rivaling 19, 1930s in terms of this could get to the level of the Great Depression if we don't have uh, government action on this. And even some of the more conservative, even some of the more, I guess you could call, uh, dovish, uh, you know, monetary policy advisors say that, you know, government action is necessary. So Pelosi is pushing for, I believe it's a $3 trillion bill. 
And the Senate Republicans and House Republicans are saying, no, absolutely, that has no uh, chance ever getting to the Senate on Mitch McConnell's desk. Uh, and part of this is also, you know, not just fiscal policy with regard to taxes, but also with regard to monetary policy. So Pelosi has been in uh, negotiations with Steve Mnuchin, who is our current Secretary of the Treasury. And even there, there doesn't seem to be a lot of agreements, despite the fact that the treasurer is supposed to be a nonpartisan office. Uh, so, you know, the more Republican people are now saying we are not going to have a stimulus bill. We are not going to have something before the election. And oftentimes I wonder if that's smart, even for Republicans, because the election is a month away. And we all know that the third quarter economic data is coming out on October 15th. And that's going to tell us basically has the economy improved at all. And if the numbers continue to slide, there's not a lot of chance for those numbers to reflect well on the president, which would be devastating again for the president's reelection campaign, given everything that's already going on. If we look at the uh, graph for unemployment this this month, it's currently at I think it's still hovering at the eight percent range. People were predicting that it was going to get under seven percent, but it's still at eight percent, which is terrible. Uh, it was actually, they said the September numbers actually missed the projections. Uh, so that's really not good news. The recovery is not happening at the speed that people were originally expecting. Um, and we just heard that Disney had to cut uh, 32,000 workers and a couple airliners are also doing that. So again, our entertainment industry is under attack. Our airline industry is struggling significantly. And again, if unemployment isn't fixed by November, it is extremely, extremely difficult for the president to get reelected. Yeah, I totally agree that America does have a history dealing with dealing poorly with a lot of recessions. And depending on what happens with this stimulus bill, if it actually achieves what it's set out to do, then this recession might lead into a depression. And things might get worse and worse to the point where it is truly worse than the Great Depression and might last longer. We hope that that isn't the case, but we certainly shouldn't leave out the possibility that that could happen. And we should start discussing things like, well, what what is the appropriate way to handle the economy if it is going to go down to that that route. But I'm, I'm definitely concerned about not just unemployment, but the inflation that's going to happen. You know, we don't really experience it right now, but the amount of money that has been injected into the economy is trillions and trillions of dollars more than what the normal rate is, which means the inflation rate is going to rapidly increase. So even if we get the unemployment fixed, which probably won't happen anytime soon, long term, we're going to have to deal with inflation, and that's going to affect everyone, not just workers, but also consumers. And that would, down the line, affect businesses as well. And that could be the reason why unemployment stays so low or so high is because of the inflation that we have not yet experienced. We're definitely going to experience that maybe in six months, in maybe a year. It's really hard to tell when the effects of inflation are going to go in, but definitely in the near future. I share Mark's concerns as well with, you know, the, yes, you know, the stimulus is, you know, it's a necessary way to go it's necessary for right now in the immediate future but we do have to worry about the the uh what, what the future holds in terms of inflation and what it means for the dollar as a whole um it's a really unfortunate circumstance that we're in and and i think economic policies are important but if but most important was getting the coronavirus policy set and having a 
proper coronavirus task force that could lead us in the right direction so that we don't have some of these troubling economic numbers. And, and I know there will be people who will say, well, it was inevitable, the pandemic was a random event, but th there was still a lack of preparation um, beforehand, which could have helped with the economic numbers later on. Um, best wishes to everyone. This is one of the toughest and roughest times in U.S. history in terms of uh, economics, for sure, and people's personal economy. So, um, yes, best wishes to all. Uh, definitely, indeed. I, I echo that. Best wishes to all. Uh, the stimulus is indeed essential, uh, but its implementation has been heavily criticized. Uh, primarily, many say it wasn't concentrated well enough, particularly among people worst affected, uh, such as the elderly, uh, people uh, in the United States living below the poverty line, uh, people of color. Uh, as well, the, the data on this uh, I wouldn't consider super definitive, but the, the data we have suggests that less than half of the money spent from the previous stim stimulus, uh, less than half of it was spent immediately. Uh, which means that uh, uh, half of the stimulus uh, failed to uh, suit its primary purpose. Um, and then uh, many claimed as well that in, in some cases it just wasn't enough uh, uh, for many people, uh, particularly people uh, like uh, homeowners who have lots of extra income, like uh, mortgage payments, car payments. Uh, $1,200 isn't going to, it's going to barely cover a mortgage payment. Uh, and then uh, a common complaint is that uh, it's been particularly poorly implemented among business owners because business owners uh, have been having trouble claiming unemployment despite having gone nearly two quarters without any income uh, and have thus uh, essentially been uh, given rather than actual cash, uh, essentially loans at low interest, which uh, is is almost worse. Um, but uh, on, it's a... Uh, it's so with a heavy heart that I that I say, if you were expecting things to be any better internationally, uh, then you're going to be disappointed, uh, because uh, uh, the Nagorno-Karabakh region between Azerbaijan and Armenia has turned into a large-scale uh, military zone, a combat zone. The region has been highly contentious since the Moscow brokered ceasefire in the 90s. Uh, for like, I want to count that, recount that, four United Nations Security Council resolutions demanded uh, unconditional withdrawal of all Armenian forces from those occupied territories, which were just ignored. Um, and the conflict is quickly starting to escalate now from um, both governments. Uh, they've declared themselves in a state of war and are uh, diverting their uh, resources to it. Uh, we're seeing uh, the, the use of, uh, of a lot of uh, high explosives uh, uh, dangerously close to, to urban areas. Uh, and its, its implications are alarming for, for U.S. foreign policy, but particularly for the European Union. Uh, that region, it, it crosses the southern gas corridor from Azerbaijan, uh, which is the only obstacle to a Russian monopoly on gas in, imports in the Balkans. Uh, I'm, I'm excited to hear all, all of you on this, but I know, I know that Mark's our foreign policy guy, so I'm, I'm super excited to see uh, what his take on, on this is. But uh, all of you, please, just uh, take it away. What, what uh, are some of, the, uh, some of the consequences of this in, in this region of the world? How can it be amended, particularly after uh, all of these uh, conflicts uh, in Yemen and between India and China? So I think that this is something that's really unexpected for 2020. I know that this conflict has been going on for decades, but this region has actually been quite silent for the last couple of years, especially under uh, President Trump. We haven't really heard much from Armenia and Azerbaijan in this, uh, what they call the Caucasus Mountains, uh, really the southern uh, boundary between Europe and Asia. Uh, so this is in a heavily contested geostrategic location. It's really where Russia, Turkey and Iran meet. Uh, historically, a lot of wars have been fought in this region, um, and, and million, actually millions of people there living currently, uh, but hundreds of different ethnic groups, obviously the main ethnic groups here being the Armenians and the Azeris of Azerbaijan. Uh, I should note, however, it's, it's interesting uh, to put some perspective here, is that the region that's currently being contested, Nagorno-Karabakh, is actually uh, Armenian. The people who live there are ethnically Armenian, and they have been Armenian for centuries. However, 
Azerbaijan was a Soviet satellite state, as was Armenia and Georgia. So these were all previously uh, Soviet Union satellite states. And what happened is when the Soviets were drawing the map, because they had really no understanding of the local culture, uh, they drew these boundaries that were totally arbitrary and created a lot of population transfer, but also a lot of anger, especially among the Armenian population that felt that a lot of their territory was illegally transferred uh, to Azerbaijan. So the current boundaries that we currently have are still post Cold War boundaries that were in place after the Soviet Union collapsed about uh, 30 years ago. Uh, it's also important to note that historically speaking, this region was Armenian. It has been Armenian for thousands of years. Um, and it, the Azerbaijani people, they're actually related uh, to the Turkish people. And they came in from Central Asia basically during the 11th century. They were called the Seljuk Turks. They basically migrated from Central Asia after being defeated by various Chinese dynasties. Um, and, and due to that, they had to migrate west and they became the very powerful Ottoman Empire, which actually controlled this region for a long time. Uh, but there is a lot of anger between Armenia and Azerbaijan and also between Turkey, because we all know that the Armenian genocide is a topic that oftentimes uh, gets ignored in light of you know bigger genocides, such as the Holocaust, which are far well known. Uh, However, you know, with regard to this Armenia conflict, we shouldn't look at it simply as between Armenia and Azerbaijan. It, it, Turkey has already entered the conflict. They've taken the side of Azerbaijan, who are basically ethnically similar to the Turks. Um, so they've been providing military support for Azerbaijan. The Russians are actually siding with Armenia. They've been allies for a long time. Armenia being a Christian country, Azerbaijan is a Muslim country. So religion is also creating a lot of divisions here. Interestingly enough, Iran has sided with Armenia, uh, despite, you know, different religions. But historically, the two peoples are, um, there's a connection there. They both speak Indo-European languages. Uh, the Turks obviously speak the Turkic languages. Uh, so ethnic uh, divisions are also playing here. And there has been some rumors that Israel has also ha uh, been providing military support for Azerbaijan. Uh, so a lot of different powers at play here. I do want to... Uh, talk about specifically Turkey's role in this region, uh, because if you look on the map, uh, Turkey is, you know, been involved in quite a few proxy conflicts in this region. They're not just only interfering in the Armenia-Azerbaijan military conflict. They're also siding with the anti-Assad rebels in Syria. Uh, if you recall, last year, Turkey actually launched an illegal military intervention in northeastern Syria, where they tried to attack the Kurds, which is another ethnic group in the region uh, that has accused Turkey of war crimes. And they're currently also trying to support um, one of the rebel groups in Libya. As you know, the civil war in Libya has not ended even after 10 years. And the Turks are siding uh, you know, on, on the side of one of the more extreme Islamic groups in, in, in Libya, which has pitted them against France and some of the other EU members. Uh, so Turkey wants to join the EU, but Politically, there's a clear distinction between where they are and where the European Union is. And so that's going to conflict their ability to uh, enter the European Union. Again, Turkey is, a, is an American ally. Russia is not. Iran is not. Uh, however, the United States is not sided with Azerbaijan. They haven't taken a position on this issue because they don't really have a bad relationship with either country. Uh, so we don't really know where the conflict is going. Uh, however, I think the biggest risk right now is not a limited border conflict between both of these Caucasus countries. I think the biggest risk is that it devolves into a situation like Syria or Yemen, where multiple major powers like Russia or Iran or the EU or Israel decide to interfere in, in, in this conflict and, and turn it into a proxy war. So that is absolutely the biggest concern currently. Yeah, just to reiterate the importance of this region, the Caucasus Mountains range, is the connection between Russia and the Middle East. And so Russia definitely has probably the biggest interest in consolidating power and allies in this region, making sure that Azerbaijan is a country that succeeds. Definitely getting support from Turkey helps a lot. And I was surprised to see that Israel might be sending aid to Azerbaijan instead of Armenia. So in this conflict, 
hopefully the United States doesn't get dragged into it, maybe through Israel or even through Turkey. Hopefully we don't get dragged into this. But historically, this region and even the Caucasus mountain range itself has been the cause of lots of conflicts. It was the one of the path uh, routes that the Soviet Union took in order to invade the Middle East, when it did in the late 70s, early 80s. It held great significance and um, strategic importance to the Russians, to the Soviet Union, but also to Iran and Turkey. As you can see, Iran is just right underneath Azerbaijan, and Turkey's right underneath Armenia. And so we have all these different interest groups who are interested in consolidating power and making sure that their allies are the ones who succeed. Maybe they themselves might not militarily um, interfere with the conflict. Let's hope that it doesn't. We don't want any more wars, but they're definitely going to be sending aid to their allies and we see more and more countries siding with Azerbaijan. Um, we see the the people who live in Azerbaijan. They have been taking more and more land historically, and I guess now recently. So maybe Azerbaijan might win this conflict just by the amount of support that it's getting over Armenia. Again, let's hope that this conflict doesn't spill over to you know Turkey fighting Iran or Saudis getting involved or Russia sending in troops. We definitely don't want another Middle, uh, Middle Eastern conflict to kind of drag nations, including the United States and the European Union. In terms of the U.S. role, I just wanted to add this. I, I, Andy correctly pointed out that the United States is supporting Azerbaijan and uh, our media, but there is a, uh, it is not completely balanced. According to Newsweek.com, U.S. military aid to Azerbaijan jumped from around $3 million in 2016-2017 to about $100 million in 2018-2019, and Armenia only received $4.2 million uh, in U.S. security assistance in the 2018 financial year. So you see the U.S., especially in the Trump era, taking a side here, taking a aside more into the Azerbaijan direction, mainly to kind of contain uh, Iran. I, I think that plays a giant role. Um, I, I Again, I, and then it goes back to the point we can talk about even past this conflict, what's been going on with U.S.-Iran tensions, Iran feeling like their back is against the wall with what happened with Soleimani, Ghassan Soleimani, and now with what you see in this uh, Armenia and Azerbaijan conflict. I think the U.S. should take a more balanced approach. I, I understand that they are supporting both sides financially, but they are taking a they're siding with they're taking one country's side more than the other even though they claim to be balanced and as a result Iran is going to feel the tension and they may lash out so um, the U.S. needs to take a more cautious approach here be a little bit more balanced maybe you know have equal financial support but um, this is really going to be uh, contentious as time goes on, and hopefully uh, there will not be a war uh, because of what has been going on between Azerbaijan and Armenia. Definitely, definitely. Uh, something that uh, needs to be mentioned uh, is with respect to the United States, uh, in recent decades, a great struggle on the U.S.'s part has been that of interventionalism. Our, our spending of money and men in conflicts abroad uh, has been heavily politicized now, and it's uh, uh, created cycles in which uh, we uh, heavily uh, financially uh, or directly support uh, a certain country in a, in a uh, proxy war or a third world conflict. Uh, and it will usually be 
uh, even if it's well intended, uh, has some kind of implication um, to further uh, national interests, uh, U.S. national interests specifically. And then uh, when it inevitably uh, doesn't go well or we get bogged down and it costs the lives of of, of citizens, of, of good citizens who uh, uh, really had no stake in, in uh, this uh, conflict so far away from home, uh, when... Uh, world leaders uh, in the United States and policymakers have those men pull back and their infrastructure pull back uh, just for the sake of saying, I brought these men home. Uh, it, uh, it results in a, in a power vacuum or a, or a hole which invites in uh, uh, more conflict, more carnage, uh, in some worst case scenarios, terrorism, state-sponsored terrorism. Uh, and then in the midst of all this tragedy, people go, where's the United States? Uh, uh, without the uh, realization that uh, the U.S. left uh, without a, a holistic plan um, for an orderly withdrawal. Uh, so and hopefully we can see some of that in the future. Uh, but uh, with that, uh, we have to conclude this weekly roundup. A lot of news, a lot of insight today. We were so happy to share it with you guys. Um, if you like what you heard, we do these weekly roundups uh, roughly every Monday. Uh, between those times, we have lots of variety of content. We have exchanges where we share multiple perspectives on a complex issue in a civil, conversational format. I recently recorded with Victoria Fisher on the issue of voting, so do be on the lookout for that. We do reflections where we evaluate the cultural impact of media and entertainment like movies and video games. Season two of The Mandalorian premieres at the end of the month on Disney+. Plus. We'll be covering that for sure. Uh, we do exclusive interviews and guest sessions with experts in a plethora of fields, and we upload all of this to Spotify, YouTube, Reddit, Pocket Cast, Twitter, uh, and Anchor.fm, through which you can support what we do directly with a donation of your choice. Um, but this has been the Harika Group Podcast, engaging the voices of tomorrow and the world of today. Thank you so much for listening. Please enjoy the rest of your week.